Good evening, ladies. ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to welcome to the uh, January meeting of the Essex County branch of the Ontario Genealogical Society. Uh, we are going to begin our meeting tonight with a very brief annual general meeting uh, prior to the presentation that uh, that will follow. So. You'll bear with us. Hopefully, uh, this won't take very long in order to uh, in order to uh, get the process underway. Okay, um, we've called the meeting to order. So one of the things we have to check out because it is an official annual meeting, and we are, as many of you know, live streaming our meetings now. Uh, unfortunately, and this is for primarily the people who are joining us online. Um, we are having some technical difficulties with our system so that tonight's meeting uh, is on Wi-Fi. And uh, we weren't able to get the other system up and operating. So just a bit of a warning. Uh, if you could turn off your, your devices in your homes or telephones here, uh, because we are on Wi-Fi, because apparently I'm not technically, technologically oriented, so I've just been told this, but if uh, we lose the Wi-Fi, which the library has had some difficulties with, you're gone. <laughs> so uh, we'll, we'll hopefully have it for the entire meeting, but uh, just be aware if uh, that happens to disappear, uh, we won't be able to get you back. We hope you agree with us for the whole thing. Okay. What I'd like to do at this point, as I say, we're going to deal with the annual general meeting first, very quickly, hopefully. And uh, what we need to know, we have to have in order to officially complete the meeting, we have to have a quorum. And that would mean that uh, we need to have at least 10 OGS Essex branch members, or OGS, yeah, Essex branch members in the room. So if you are an Essex branch OGS member, could you please raise your hand? I count 12, 13. So we are official. <laughs> so anything we say may be taken down and used against us. Okay. Uh, so we have a confirmation of the quorum, uh, and uh, the, uh, the there was due notice sent out by the the branch, uh, indicating that the, this meeting would be held at the beginning of the January meeting. Uh, the minutes themselves apparently are available, are they not? Uh, they were sent to all the members in an email that was sent out last week. Thank you. So you should receive the uh, minutes from the previous annual general meeting. Uh, any one wish to propose approval of those minutes? Maggie? Seconded? Malcolm? Uh, approved. Okay, any discussion? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor then of, of uh, let's see where, okay. Uh, okay, I guess we've done that. Uh, the annual reports and the committee reports, uh, um, the situation regarding that is that they are available on the website, and uh, so we won't refer to them particularly here at this point in time, as well as the financial statement uh, that were there, that was available is also on the website. Um, just for clarification at this point, we need to approve do we not? Well, I prepared a newsletter, just a little brief, 
So I have a report. I don't know if any of the other committee members have a little brief little blurb that they want to do. Pat, you do? Yeah. yeah, and I do as well. I don't know if anybody wants to just okay. briefly do that. Might as well do that at this point if you suspect the annual report. Huh? Um, I'm Pat Knight, the Senate Director. Pat, can you go up to the microphone oh, if you don't mind? Thanks. My name is Pat Clancy, and I'm the cemetery coordinator for Essex Branch of OGS. Um, over the past year, the typing and proofing of St. Peter's section of Heavenly Rock Cemetery was completed um, in 2015. And many thanks to Kathy Hamill for most of the typing and to Betty Garrett for the proofing of that section. So over the winter, the remainder of the document is being prepared uh, for publication and will play sometime this year. Um, and an index is also being compiled. And over the past few years, there's been a movement from the transcription of cemeteries to the photographing of markers and putting them online for access, easier access by more researchers. And because of the significant manpower involved in and timeframes necessary in transcribing and then typing and proofing and publishing um, uh, cemeteries, um, the Essex branch is also moving towards doing photographing instead of uh, transcribing. So, um, over the next um, over the next few months, we'll be taking steps to put that into motion. And branch members will be advised of developments, and we welcome anyone that's um, interested in participating in that aspect. Because there are a lot of cemeteries in Windsor and Essex County um, that haven't been put online yet. There are a number of different websites. Um, many cemeteries that are online at this time. Okay. Any questions? Any questions, questions for Pat? Okay, we all uh, want to call on Maggie uh, Patterson to provide a summary of the, uh, of the financial statement. I'm Maggie Patterson. I'm the acting treasurer. <laughs> Um, I was not able to get online today to get my December bank statement, so this is just a quick calculation. Our total um, income for the year is $2,342.19. Total expenses, $2,187.76, leaving us $154.43 in the black at the end of November. I wrote one check in December for $46.54. So we'll wind up about $100 in the black which isn't bad since we're a nonprofit, and uh, the financial statements I'm working on year end right now will be sending those off to our provincial office, and they will be published in the next issue of the newsletter. Thanks, Maggie. Any questions regarding financial statement as is? Okay, uh, briefly. Pick me, pick me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Cindy Robichaud, I'm the newsletter editor. Um, if you become a member of our branch, uh, four times a year we have newsletters that we, that we send out for our membership. Um, it's called The Trails, is the name of our, our publication. And the majority of our membership receive our, uh, our publication via electronic. Uh, version now, which is great because it's a great cost savings to the branch. We switched over a few years ago, and I applaud everybody that said they would take it electronically because substantial savings for the branch. Um, we have lots of topics that are covered. For example, we did uh, our first issue issue was around Black history, so we did the Voice of the Slave, um, the first Black operated newspaper in um, Canada. We did an issue that focused around sandwich, so there's a lot of articles around the sandwich area. Um, 100 women in Essex and Kent count or Essex and Windsor from uh, 1867 to 1967. So it was a complete list of some uh, biography of 100 women that uh, the branch felt that it was they were of importance. Um, there was an article about the archives of Ontario. We had a speaker come and talk about that. So there was a, a whole article in there. Um, schools in Essex County. Uh, there was an article on the North Ridge um, rifles in Essex County, um, Feeney and Raids as well. So it's a variety of topics and we're always looking for submissions too. So that's what, yeah, you uh, will get if you join the branch and enjoy our trails issue. Thanks. Thank 
Thanks, Amy. Uh, program. Uh, my name is Jim McTavish, and I'm the program coordinator for the grant. And my report has not yet been uh, posted to the, the website, but it has been submitted. And just to simply say that uh, we had a very full year last year. Uh, we had a variety of speakers on many different topics, and uh, it went very, very well in terms of, uh, of the interest and I think the information that people gained. So the listing of uh, the speakers from last year will be on the report that will be on on the website. So if you're interested in checking that out, uh, please please do so. Uh, we also are. I would like very I'm very happy to announce that so far we have speakers for the entire year up to June. So again, a very wide variety of topics and people uh, that uh, that for your interest and. Uh, learning. I think you enjoy the group that we've assembled so far. So we're moving forward in regard to that information. Um, okay, um, just in finalizing this, this particular section, um, with the reports having now been presented, uh, let's begin with the financial statements. Uh, we have a motion to approve Financial statement as presented by my uh, Malcolm, seconder, Colleen, in favor. Okay, thank you. Uh, and in regard to uh, um, the committee reports, those uh, those I would think uh, don't require a a motion at this point. Um, any discussion at all regarding the, the uh, presentations? Any questions for members of the uh, our executive? Jim, could you give us a list of what the presentations are? Just a little sentence sure. on each of the next six months. Oh, in the next six months? Well, until June or whatever. Okay. Whatever, uh -huh. whatever. Well, do you have it written down? I don't want to put you. No, on. Bit, uh, I don't have it written down at the moment. Oh, well, with okay. me. Okay, I know the next month we have a presentation by Jane Butterby, uh, who has written a, a novel set in the time of uh, the early parts of the, uh, the black arrival in Amherstburg. And so what with that context uh, in her novel, she will be talking about the story, which will therefore uh, in, in, involve the, uh, the circumstances that the story of saying so that, that okay. would, and that is what we sometimes will try and do if possible is for February we have theme months so in February we try to have a presentation that ties in with Black History Month and at the end of the uh, year in November we try and tie into uh, Remembrance Day so we, we, as I say that will be available uh, we'll post it on the website so that everyone can take, take a look at what we plan for now to June um, okay, elections, um, we have a need or a hope for volunteers to uh, be part of uh, the executive, just to let you know who we have on the executive at this point in time. We have positions which are vacant. Uh, the chair, vice chair, uh, secretary, and treasurer uh, are basically open. Maggie has consented to uh, serve, uh, continuing on with the, the treasurer's job, so should there not be someone who will take her place at this point. But uh, right now, the other members of the executive are, that's the table officers, those are the table officers. The committee groups, uh, Pat Clancy, as earlier noted, 
uh, is in charge of cemeteries and the Ontario Name, Naming Ind Index. Okay. Linda Urquhart, could you just raise your hand so people can see who we are, uh, is uh, a recent addition as a volunteer and she's looking after the library. Uh, Philip Gross is uh, taking on the role of membership chair. Uh, the newsletter, you've already heard from Cindy. Uh, I'm the program coordinator. We have a position, volunteer position of publications. Uh, it is currently vacant. Uh, publicity, Michelle Watson, at the camera there. Uh, research, Colleen Olette. And, and uh, the website, David Hutchinson. Okay. Unfortunately, I understand in talking with her that we are going to lose Colleen. Uh, she and her husband are moving closer to uh, Eastern Ontario to be near their their daughter, and we're going to certainly miss Colleen, who has spent many years on the on the council and a tremendous person involved with any research questions that people had, she was able to come up with the answers that they were looking for, hopefully. So, Colleen, you will be missed, Thank you. for sure. Um, now, for those positions, as I say, publications or, or any willingness to help in any way would be welcome. Um, I'm not going to... Uh, ask you at this point to volunteer, per se, but I'd like you to think about the many ways that, as we've indicated with the committees here, where help could be help useful to us and give you a chance to get a greater understanding of the, the society itself. Jim, yes? May I, I, at this point, say that I'm ably, I'm going to be ably replaced by Linda Urquhart as we search. Thank you. She's taking mm -hmm. over immediately. Okay, I appreciate that, and Linda, thank you for doing, doing that. We also, um, what I was simply going to say is that, please think about it, it's not a lot of work, uh, whatever time you could devote, uh, and you can do this online, you can do it uh, in your own home, wherever, or whatever jobs that, that do come up. I would simply say, please consider volunteering some time, and if you're interested in doing it, Please let us know uh, before the at the end of the meeting, and we'll gladly let you know what uh, what is needed at this point, or if you have a particular interest that you want to pursue. Okay, any uh, I guess at this point we have nominations if there are any. <coughs> Second call. Third call. Seeing none, uh, nominations are closed. Uh, someone second the motion. Malcolm. And that concludes our, our annual meeting. Appreciate your patience in, in having us do that particular activity this evening. But again, before I turn this over, uh, I would like to ask you to consider what time you might be able to devote to, to the, the organization. We'll give you some assistance. We'll let you know what needs are. Please see that one of the council at the end of the meeting. Okay. Let's get on then with the the presentation. Just to, before we do, uh, some of the upcoming events that may be of interest to uh, members here or people who are in attendance. Couple of events coming in the near future. Uh, the, the February 8th is our next meeting, and as I mentioned, the title of the presentation is An Unexpected Friendship, Amherstburg 1846. Uh, the Black History Month uh, kickoff is January 29th. There are a number of events planned for Black History Month in February. Uh, you may wish to take those in and do a lot more details that's available. 
AIRS, the Harrow Early Immigrant Research Society meeting, January 28th at Kingsville Museum. Uh, it's a military presentation on the group of soldiers called the 42 crew. Uh, in regard to our own Essex County branch collection, as it says there, under construction, the library is is uh, making some changes to the second floor to the uh, collection that we have and their own collection. And I think when it's finished, I think everyone will be quite pleased with the, the changes. Uh, we will hope that, uh, that that will be done fairly soon. And just news from the provincial office, that the provincial office is moving from downtown Toronto to Guam um, to be closer to the archives of Ontario. Okay. Just, just a bit of information at this point in terms of this process. We did indicate at the beginning that the uh, the uh, meetings now are live streamed uh, when possible, Wi-Fi if necessary. Uh, the purpose being that about three quarters of the members of this branch uh, do not live in the immediate area. And so by beginning to live stream and put the meetings on uh, an electronic format, uh, people from as far away as California and other places who came from Essex County and would like to know what is being done, um, they can access these meetings on a regular basis and go back and access previous meetings and see what was done. So uh, that is a new wrinkle. It seems to be working well. We've had pretty good response from the people in, at a distance to uh, viewing the meetings online. And so we hope to continue that. Uh, tonight, the presentation, we have talked, had people talk to us from Archives of Ontario, Library and Archives Canada, and also we have visited a number of places such as Ayers, which is out in Carroll. And it was time, I think, for sure, uh, overdue really, to find out about the archives of Windsor, the Windsor Municipal Archives. So we have had the chance to contact Michael Fish, who is the archivist, and he has graciously consented to talk about the Windsor Archives, because being an Essex County branch, we certainly know that people, uh, in many cases, are interested in what might be in that particular facility, how to access it, and generally information related to the archives. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Michael Fish. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, I did speak to the OGS uh, branch about 10 years ago, I think. Uh, so I have been, I've been invited pre previously. I think I've probably been due uh, since that time. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I've been working for the library for 17 years, uh, all of the archives. Uh, things have been shaken up in the last couple months. Uh, as you walk by down here, you pass signs saying archives and municipal archives. Uh, that used to be the reading room. That's no longer the reading room anymore. Uh, at the beginning of November, I was moved up to the second floor. They, the goal is to put up a reading room up north east uh, corner of the second floor. That has not yet happened, unfortunately. It would have been nice to kind of take you up there and maybe show you the new reading room. But uh, uh, maybe next month uh, there will be uh, an opportunity then to take it in and take a look at it. Uh, it's supposed to go up this week, but they've been saying that's the last two months, <laughs> the end of November and December. So who knows? Uh, so it's kind of changed the dynamics and how I handle customers and all that because it used to be all very nicely, it's all together right back down here. Now the material has to be carted up and down from the, up to the floor. Um, but we'll make do with what we can. Uh, the Winter Community Archives, Municipal Archives, 
was started in 1984 as an official repository for the city of Windsor's material. Uh, at that time, there was talks with the University of Windsor to kind of share resources. This facility here would be the repository for the city, and they would be the repository for uh, private collections. Um, it ended up that we became both doing both jobs. Uh, the Lee University didn't get their archives started until the early 90s, almost 10 years after this one was started. Um, most of the collection is municipal records, uh, but 85% of what we hold is uh, from Windsor and previous communities. We only collect four Windsor and predecessor communities, that includes private collections. We don't collect material from Essex County at all. Um, so, I do get people every once in a while wanting to donate from the end of the county, and unfortunately, I have to say no. Uh, you just unfortunately don't have the space. If I'm saying no to people here in Windsor, that's when you can't say yes to somebody from the county. Uh, so we only just take for for the Windsor region, Windsor previous municipalities, and not part of the Windsor area. Uh, so. Give you some dirty details of the archives. It's approximately approximately one kilometer of textual records. So if you were to put all the records on and both <laughs> measure about a kilometer long, we have about twenty thousand sets of individual photographs. That includes uh, regular print photographs, uh, negatives, glass slides, um, uh, slides. We have approximately twenty-five thousand sets of architectural drawings in our holdings. Um, that may look like a lot, but we're pretty small. Uh, a lot of your archives, Canada, I believe, has 143 miles of architectural records and 3 million individual photographs in their holdings. So we're just a little tiny archives in comparison <laughs> to them. Um, so uh, Jim had asked me to talk to you about kind of things that you would find here that may be of use to genealogists. And unfortunately, genealogists only comprise a very large part of our. Uh, user base, only account for about 5% of our user base. Uh, the biggest user is obviously the city itself, and then about half the users are uh, actually uh, businesses. So genealogists make up about 5% of our users, and um, so we don't have a lot. Most of your material, most people come here to do research, go to the second floor and do the genealogy materials here, that's deposited by you folks here in the library. Um, what we do have, we do have, uh, and I did bring a few things. Normally when I have tours, and I bring material out in the reading room, they put it out so you can see what kind of things are found in the archives. Uh, when we do the tour later on, you'll see it's mostly just a lot of boxes and things like that. So I usually try to, I did bring a few items here, I'll put them out after I'm finished speaking. And I brought some items that are related to the, what you would find, that, that would find, that you know, so would find interesting. Uh, one of the things I brought was a assessment roll. Uh, we have assessment rolls dating back to 1854 uh, for the village of Windsor and the town of Sandwich. We have assessment rolls for most of the communities, the townships of Sandwich South, Sandwich West, uh, Sandwich East, and all the Riverside, of course, Fort City, uh, Walkerville. Uh, we also have a very interesting 1864 Census. In 1864, the town of Windsor decided to do a census. They wanted to get a sense of how many Americans were coming across the border during the American Civil War. So that's been that's quite a resource. Of course, if you have family that live in that area, you can find it interesting. Um, so all these things, and the final thing was something we retrieved from the land registry office was the land registry documents. We have 480,000 of these deeds, and uh, they can provide quite a bit of information inside where a family bought and sold the property. Uh, they gave their spouse, they gave their occupation, uh, quite often years of age. Quite often, all these deeds also contain things like uh, wills, probate orders. Uh, so, we're slowly entering all this information. These, each deed has to be entered individually into our database before we can access them before it's accessible to the public. Uh, these deeds were transferred in 2001 from because they wanted to destroy them. They had been uh, microfilmed by the Land Registry Office, uh, um, and then 
that we're going to plan the strike. We can cry from the heritage community across the province against destroying them, uh, rose up. Uh, so they tried to find various uh, repositories where we could take them. We were one of them. We took Windsor and its predecessor communities, and we also took a lot of town with Sal. Now, the, the land registry deeds that we have here date from 1867 from the Confederation to 1955. Anything prior to 1867 is at the Arapahoe of Ontario. Anything after 1955 is still at the land registry office. Now, you really have to access these deeds through the use of building, if you know the lot, and register plan property with those that may have owned. Uh, most likely, probably by the name. I don't think you can access them that way at the land registry office. I think you just do it by a lot and register plan there. So here you'll be able to access, you can simply give me a name and I can be able to type and say, well, whether we have something or not. And you can pull that material out. Um, right now, this is an ongoing project. I'm probably an ongoing project until I retire. Um, we've done the South, we've done pretty much all the Mount Bay community gigs, communities, Walkerville, Ford City, Riverside. Township of Sandwich, south and west, or east, sorry. The town of Windsor. Uh, I'm working on the city of Windsor right now. And we will be working at, and we're also working on the township of Sandwich, west. They're very large, the amount of, they're like 50,000 feet from the municipalities. Um, so it takes a while before they'll be able to move up. And I suspect they'll be retiring even done yet. Um, so that's uh, that's kind of an overview of the kind of things that may be of interest to people in this room here. Um, now we also have maps. We have these I'm actually pull on. This item here is one of the most used items in our collection. It's called fire insurance plans. These are called fire insurance plans. And they're very highly detailed. So you might find where your family lived uh, 90 years ago. This is the map in 1924. And it give you a sense of the neighborhood that existed at that time. And it's all close to where you get this uh, sense of the construction of the house. Uh, yellow here is uh, for wood construction, it's brick, things like that. These are great resources. I mean, they're not really directed to me, but it gives you an uh, adds to the picture, <coughs> especially if you're not familiar with winter. Gives you a sense of what was there. And uh, we have uh, 24, 1937, and a 52. They're open here. These are used pretty much at least often. Um, like I said, uh, the and uh, the biggest users for those are environmental groups. Uh, they use that to determine what was there in the past uh, when they're doing an environmental assessment of, uh, of a property or something like that. Uh, I've been told things like to look for dry cleaning businesses, uh, obviously underground tanks, please show where the underground tanks were. Uh, it's just interesting just to see the evolution of the neighborhood. Uh, the 1924 map, you quite often see these outhouses are very much prevalent with other communities. Uh, so it's kind of interesting that we see them by 1937. In indoor plumbing. So, yeah, so it's moving ahead, kind of thing, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so they're a very fascinating um, resource for anybody. I think that people are doing maybe home, home histories, which is another large group. You see some here, guys. You can buy a house in the we were there when it was constructed, um, that kind of thing. Um, and again, we'll use those um, tax fees. Um, like assessment roles we use to determine when their house is built. And so that's about it. I don't know if anybody has any questions. Okay, question on firemen. Uh, I assume they're written by insurance companies. Yes. And give me, I, I have a sense, but you tell me, which, from your point of view, why do they do that? Why do they make the maps? They made the, these maps were sent out to the various service agencies throughout the country. Uh, these were used to determine what you would pay in in insurance to insure your property. Um, they were geared to fire at one time. Fire was the big thing to worry about. So there's things like on these maps you can see on this one here, you can see it shows where the fire hydrant is located. 
It also shows where the fire alarm were located as well, it's called the fire alarm. Uh, so you can then have uh, phones back right. then. So they would use this to calculate what you would pay in it. Okay. And can I assume like the yellow ones were wood and the red ones were brick kind of thing? Yes, yes. So, if you, so if you had a yellow house, you paid more than a brick. But if you were if you were brick, even though you're surrounded by yellows, you might still pay more because you're more more likely to be damaged. Be, yeah. Even though yeah. you yourself might not have the fire, but now your neighbor might start yes. a fire and you burn <laughs> down because he was brick. Yes, yeah. I mean it could be. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure. making this up, but I'm just yeah. speculating. Yeah, exactly. You know, distance from the fire hydrant, that kind of thing. And uh, more, the more distance from a fire station, these are all play into you know, the more more wooden houses that surround you, the more likely you're going to burn. Right. And if you're in an industrial area, too, we'd probably have a factor as well. So okay. I mean, we may take all these kind okay, of well, thank you for explaining. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, they were very fascinating. Unfortunately, they don't make these anymore. 52, 52 is the last one for Windsor. Uh, yes. I, I was wondering about the, you said that there were, uh, you had the land registry documents. Is that what the land books are? Land books? The land registry books, they're at the university. We have the uh, property. What we have is this. This is issued for every sale, change in ownership of the property. We have 480,000. You'll like see the them as we go to the back. Are those like the abstract? Oh, these are the deeds. Those are the deeds. These are the copy of the deeds. This is what you would get if you buy one. This is the, this is the land registry's copy. Would that be before 1867? Well, we have between 1867 and 1855. But the land registry books are earlier than that. You're saying you don't have. No, they, anything before 1865 is allocated to the Archives and Carriage. I'm not sure why that was done. That's just, we were given between 1860, basically from Confederation to 1955. Uh, 1955 are still located at the land registry offices. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah, think the university has the books there. Now, anybody can come in and access the archives. You don't need to be a member of the Windsor Public Library. I have you fill out a form at the beginning of the year, or the first time you come in in the year. And that form is good for the year. Um, and you just ask, based on the information your address, and you just ask for what you were searching. And that's done for just for all interest. So I know that you know, five percent of you for genealogy just come in and do genealogy, um, that kind of thing. And we keep that information for the current year and then two previous years after that, and then just destroy it, that information. We don't sell it, we don't put it anywhere, we don't allow anybody to view it, or anything like that. Um, and then we just ask for your phone have to provide some ID, whether it's a user public library card or a driver's license or something like that. So anybody can come in. Now today, said that things have changed. Before you would come in down here, uh, now you would come up to the second floor to the reference desk up there, you would ask for me. It's a little more difficult to say. I'm now trying to encourage people because I'm not always here during the day. Um, I mean, the hours on the website say Tuesday to Saturdays, 10 to 1, 2 to 5. Um, don't go by that. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, I say I tend to encourage people to call ahead or email and just say we need a round. Tom Vage, I suppose, to kind of help with this, but Tom's not an expert in the archives. And, He's got his own issues with genealogy people, you guys, and you know, and the history department. So, um, yeah, usually I try to encourage people to contact me so I can say, yeah, I'm going to be here this day. I'm talking to them. So come in when I'm not here because then I can't guarantee you're going to be helped. So it's a little more difficult. I find. Yes. Um, I was going to ask about fire hydrants. We've moved on. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't. I just. I apologize. No, no. Um, I, when did we get fire hydrants? Where they uh, uh, when did they occur? On I, I believe it's I believe in the late, late 19th century they started like 1890s when they started doing improvements to streets and things like that. And, uh, when the water works were put in, I don't have an exact date, but I believe just going to like the bylaws that we have, we've seen when the street improvement bylaws were coming in and things like that. Uh, it started basically in the late part of the 19th century. Shortly after the big fire that burned the whole place yeah, down. Well, exactly. And Walkerville was very progressive, of course, when they built their city. That was all planned. It's part of it when they started Walkerville. It was, yeah, it was uh, paved streets and fire hydrants and this kind of stuff. Yeah. 
So uh, Poplar was very much progressive in that. But I believe, yeah, for the journey. It was very, it was just progressive. You see it slowly as money came. It would, it would uh, quite often see what the adventure would pay for improvements on roads and, and sewers and that kind of thing. Yes? Do you think they're going to bring some things that are now in the archives up into the new reading room? Um, I understand it's going to be local history. Local, local history, history yeah. Local history, yeah. Local history, genealogy material for sure will probably be up there. Most of the material is still will remain down here in the stack area, close stack, which I'll show you later on. Uh, the main, there was talk about bringing uh, listed fire insurance plans upstairs just because they're used so often, as long as they can be put somewhere where they can be locked. But uh, other than that, it'd be very little to be upstairs. So, uh, I mean, I don't know if you do today, and the elevator's not working, and I have to lift a large accessible or something like that. You know, I know, I know that's, that's the problem. <laughs> I mean, that elevator goes out all the time, so you know, yeah. get her exercise in anyways. <coughs> Any other questions? Michael, could you uh, imagine to go ahead or or to uh, uh, let the email yeah. uh, of the interest in uh, coming to the archives? Could you give us your uh, email address? Oh, I've got some business cards. Okay. Uh, anyway, one's business, but my, uh, for those who mfish at newsrepubliclibrary.com or archives at newsrepubliclibrary.com. Either one I'll check. I'll check these daily. And you're interested in it. You can also just ask me, you know, if you're looking for material or have it or not, uh, and uh, let you know. And so it's not a total waste of time. Come in if I don't have anything for you. And then we can say it's a good time to come in. I don't take appointments or anything because I can't guarantee if I'm on the desk that I'm not helping somebody else out the time as well. But I can at least tell you I'm around. Yes. You mentioned the uh, 1864 census that was done to determine. How many people were from the U.S.? Yes. Yeah. Well, on the census, it would say what your U.S. Uh, origins, or it could. It would say where you may necessarily were born from. Like, so you get people from England as well, and all that. So they say they're from Windsor or from the states. Do you have any stats as to what ten percent were from the U.S.? I don't have, no. I haven't sat down and that. I mean, you're welcome to go through it. <laughs> if I can tell, I don't know. Uh, I mean, it was a municipality that I was kind of curious as to how many Americans were kind of coming across, and then you're waiting on the fight for the war. Yes? Uh, this is one of the There is. The census is definitely one we'd like to get up there. Uh, right now, we have some of the photographs uh, online. Uh, there is a goal to so get more of them online. Other staff, I mean, you're looking at, yes, he basically uh, the archives for a city of 20,000 people, so things are somewhat slow going. Um, but yeah, I mean, definitely they can be, I like to get the census up there. Uh, eventually, I'd like to get the, this 1924 map online as well. Uh, so, the goal is to, uh, what we'd like to do is if you type in the city address and this address, we would pull up any information, all the information we would have on that address. Here at the whole here. So, we do, I mean, it's more for again, looking at home history and things like that. But that would be the kind of thing we're looking at doing. Why are you doing that? I think there's somebody in the back. Well. Oh, if you spit, go. Oh. Yeah. Uh, there was somebody in the back over this side. Well, I'm just uh, from the University of Windsor here at the library. Uh, they have a new scanner that uh, it's, it's made the books for it, but it will also be larger. Probably in census, but I don't know if that would be of interest. Okay, but we just got a book center itself. Oh, yeah. So it's a $10,000 one? I'm not sure how much. I don't think it's a $10,000 one. No, I don't think it's a 10000 uh, We're not as rich as the university, so <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's quite that. Uh, yeah, we just, we just got to just after Christmas. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we're going to start playing around with that. So, yeah, get, like the census would be definitely something I'd like to get up there. So, uh, these masks, these, these are. You know, I'm going to do 24 because this is still actually covered by restriction and by the owner of the maps. Mm -hmm. And it's a 90 year restriction on those maps. Ooh. So you can go to the universities that have these maps, you find it normally up to 1924. Uh, so we put this, uh, the owners, and, and supposedly it's the insurance agency is the only one that owns these maps. We don't even know. Uh, 
you know, the design year restriction on publication that we have. So I like it the 24 up there because it's now up to 90 years. So there's plans. I mean, it's just very slow going. Will your book scanners in that side? No. But it's been scanned. We have a roller scanner. We have a roller okay. scanner, so it's a uh, roller scanner that has been scanned out. So oh, okay. All these fire, all our maps have been scanned. Oh. Most of our printed, printed photographs have been scanned as well. Um, the the uh, census has not been scanned yet, so, but that shouldn't be too much. Now we've got the book scanned, that should be a problem. Would it be in a PDF format? Is it? I would assume so, yeah. And hopefully, it, it also somewhere you can type it in and pull up that page map. It's all it's handwritten though. It's yeah, it is handwritten. So yeah, it'll be yeah. Once it's scanned, we'll have to see how it interprets the handwriting. But the hand I've got it here, so you can take a look. I'll put it out here, and you can take a look at it. Actually, the handwriting is actually very nice. I can't say that for a lot of handwriting from the 19th century. Mm -hmm. A lot of really poor handwriting. Uh, so we chastise people here today. <laughs> Even the 19th century wasn't that great. Yes. Um, the 1864 census. Could the municipality oblige people, like the federal government would oblige people to fill in the census? They had to. But this, you can't imagine a municipality will actually oblige people to fill in the census. Yeah, I'm not sure what the legal yeah, that's they right. have that's to, kind of force you to. Because you people know, just say, I, uh, forget it. You know, I'm not telling you what. There might be. I mean, there might be people who just didn't. Uh, yeah, I'm just you know, curiosity. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I assume there might be some people who just said, you know, I'm not going to give it. But I don't think people quite did. Are you concerned about the privacy? Of the Not back in the hundred years, yeah, ago, fifty yeah. years ago. Yeah, so I'm pretty sure there was pretty high privacy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, again, you could legally force them. I don't think there's anything they could legally do. Yeah. Force it. That's why I asked. So I don't know. I don't. So I'm pretty sure somebody came by and just locked in your house. And, yeah. You know, that. Tell me about yourself. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yes. Uh, you mentioned staffing and how it's just you basically. Uh, are there opportunities for let's say undergraduate students in history? Volunteer or perhaps pseudo internships, unpaid, like the public? There is a little bit. Uh, the problem is that it's a union place, so you can't do union work, mm -hmm. which restricts greatly what you can do with uh, the volunteer. Um, I do usually write a Young Canada Awards grant every year. Um, most years I've been successful, so you usually get a student. I mean, it's required to be a student, so you need to get a student. Um, I do have a couple of pages working for me that are usually students as well. Um, I've had one that's been working for me for five years and one I've been for three, actually. Five years started in high school. Um, but the, the third three years, I started as a young Canada Works student in the grad program at District University. So I have a little bit. I try, you know, I try to uh, hire students for the time. Just, just no money in the budget. I mean, we can try uh, volunteer. Last time we had a volunteer, it was probably about 15 years ago, and it was really just a make work project for this person. This person had graduated from library school and was just kind of waiting for an opportunity to turn itself, so keep herself busy. And it was just kind of writing down the, the, miss, the, the missing deeds and, and, and the collection. Part. I didn't really feel that there was worth somebody's time to do that. Um, so we kind of there's some projects that I could try to find out, but it's, it's it's limited as to what I can do. What I need to get done has to be done by some of the archivists trained. So and, uh, so, but it's something to discourage me to get into contact because I did have a there is a young lady who's called uh, a couple weeks ago looking for the future. So I think they're trying to get a uh, co-op program off the ground in the Department of History. So. Oh, okay, so really? Okay. Yeah. So it would be credit hours. Basically. Yeah. Well, we had, when the archive program was uh, in a, going into the history program back in the 90s, uh, a lot of the students did their practicums here. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the, uh, uh, the call, uh, farms were collections were organized by the students for the time. So that was definitely helpful. They were, of course, they were knowledgeable because they uh, we're in the program, so they can, you know, they can do that as part of their programs to arrange a collection. Right. Uh, yes. Well, the facility can be beautiful and have an archive for you, or do you have to do the archive? 
Um, I was thinking maybe doing something this year. Uh, usually the week of April the 6th is usually Archives Awareness Week. Um, I've generally not, I haven't done anything. The last time we did something where we just threw the doors open to the public was um, about 2000 for Open Doors. When we sort of had an Open Doors. We were, we were involved in that in 2000 and 2001, I think. And I believe 2001 was very successful. Not too many people showed up, so we really haven't done it since. I've usually just had tours with groups, as opposed to individuals, yes. But I was thinking maybe doing something like that for this year for um, Archives of Redis Week. What happens uh, if the library is supposed to size it and move somewhere else? Uh, what will happen with the archives? And uh, on the other part of that question, uh, the library itself has a lot of uh, commission records, uh, commission sites. We do not do but I hope they are making go with it. If, if we move to another building, then they are moving to another building as well. Um, we don't really generally take art as part of the archives. Uh, usually, if anybody wants to donate, we encourage them to take it to the art gallery. Uh, they have the facilities and the staff and all of that to uh, preserve uh, art pieces. But this isn't part of my talents, if you want. So usually I would, I would not take it. I, mean, I just hope the library would find a use for it in the new building. Uh, there's talk right now I mean, to the far the old firewall sandwich on Hill Street. Mm, no. The archives local history, probably the genealogy collection and the sandwich library you all crammed into that building. So the city of Yes, yes. Um, if, if we move from this facility to another facility, I know they're talking about shrinking the square footage of the, the new facility that we move from. But I, that's all speculation at the moment. How do you feel about the past picture? I mean, there's definitely a photograph that it's going to I'm not going to comment on, on that. It's like I said, I mean, right now it's a lot of speculative. So I mean, I'm not going to say what's. Would you agree that this building is designed as not only a library, but a main library? And when you move to a secondary, second hand building, you're going to have features of physical features that I will go in and so it has actually could be heritage um, listed as a modern. It could be. I mean, again, I mean, I can't really speculate on. On I mean, I don't know if the this is a resource library, not just a library. It's a the resource library for the city of Windsor. Um, but I guess the most people migrate to the internet. There's less need to have as much well, material here. On the other hand, uh, you mentioned one time that uh, the city still retains tons of records in whatever state of affairs in the basement of City Hall, and so there's. Not even um, a proper correlation on the city's part, though so we do the professional part here um, in the material gathered at one spot. Like if you look at the city, I mean, I don't know if they're very obvious, but one of the things for the metro and now maybe it's the metro record at the building 12 that has, but um, the building is just there because why can't the city, well, you have to ask the city politicians for that answer. <laughs> I can't give you an answer for that. This is maybe the only one you can for what I have. Yes, yeah. I, mean, yeah. I can't worry about what they've got in the word city hall. <laughs> they wouldn't be as effective as keeping them in a, in a 
the central location, yes, it would be great if it was all one location because it's very annoying and sometimes I have to send somebody to see all the minutes because I don't have those minutes here. You see all that you have to move the all the stuff to view with our guys that they have here. Um I I doubt they do, but I'm, I mean uh, that's I mean again, I mean I can't worry about how city deals with stuff that's over in the city. I can't worry about what's here. What on the road can you tell me one time when you're doing the research field, uh, you're on a bus station, uh, somebody from, well, even the previous archivist uh, had mentioned that somebody had um, borrowed the original drawings from the very bus station and returned scotch tape together, yeah. Xerox copies with missing pages, yeah. which is absolutely ridiculous. And obscene, I think it was an archival professional. And, and the cities that do that, and like, you know, where's the, the standards and the regulations? So. Yeah, that was before my time, so yeah, I mean, it's very frustrating that uh, those people you know, on the original blueprints to that building have you know, gone back to City Hall for some reason, and, you know, and like you said, photocopied it and scotch tape it to us, gave us that copy back. One more, uh, you mentioned earlier about the fact that they, uh, some of the material the pictures you mentioned are uh, accessible online. Yes. Is that accessible online off site or do you have to come down to? Just the, go uh, through the Windsor Public Library's website. Okay. Uh, resources, I believe it is. You see there's a drop down menu and yeah. it's, um, I'm trying to think of what it is under. Um, it's something all through the website. Yeah, it's just through the website. Okay. That, that I think is uh, becoming more and more important to people to be able to access off site uh, the resources that they're, they're looking oh, at. Yes. And you don't need a credit card to access this or anything like that. So you just go on and look away. Uh, nice for those photographs. It also includes a lot of the most of photographs are actually from the museum. Great. Thank you. Michael, on behalf of the Essex Branch of OGS, I'd like to thank you very much for your presentation and give us some ideas that have been a lot of us for taking the So I'll, I'll hold some of the documents I brought here so you can take a look and then we'll take a little bit of tours of the, the archive itself. Okay. So if you're able to stay, take a look at what Mike was going to put out and um, we will do that. and. Uh, Again, thank you very much for uh, for your presentation tonight. I just want to mention something. I just want to mention something to the folks at home. Um, I will try to do some recording as we walk around, but I'm not sure how it's going to work. And then it would just be uploaded later. So I'll, I'll see what we can do. An example of the, one of the deeds. And there was a livery right there. Exactly. Yeah. Um, 
We'll try to do a videotape the tour as we're going along and we'll just add it to YouTube if we can. So thanks for joining everyone. Night.